for the compliance regulation of the seeds. Um, he's from Las Vegas, and growing up, he worked on uh, farms in Idaho during the summer by the encouragement of his father. Um, he is married with five kids and ten grandchildren. Uh, he went to Brigham Young for his bachelor's and master's, and then to Mississippi State for his Ph.D., and uh, recently was elected VP of the Society of Commercial Seed Technologists. Correct? All right. So it, uh, please help me welcome uh, Dr. David Stimson. It's to a group that's forced to be there, you know, so they can't really leave. And, uh, so so uh, I always have a, you know, a, a, an audience. But uh, so this time, hopefully, I can entice you to stay. Um, I, I've been working with seeds just for 18, uh, well, since, uh, since 1988. It's not that long. Um, coming up on. 30 years, <laughs> and uh, it, it has been a, an interesting experience for me. I never thought that I would, uh, I would actually get involved in anything like this, but I, I want to tell, tell you that, a little bit of that history and then why I think seeds are important. Okay, got that button down. I like it. All right. All right. Well, so I think seeds are important. Go ahead to the next one. So uh, a lot of people, when they speak, they get emotional. And, and, you know, when I talk about seeds, I kind of get emotional, too. And sometimes... It's because, well, you know, we got in trouble and there's a stop sale and we didn't meet the regulations or something like that. But that's not the most I'm talking about. Next. To me, seeds are awe-inspiring. And, and I'll, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But to me, there, there's something about seeds that is special. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> next. So often they're misunderstood and and or, or under uh, undervalued. Uh, I work a lot with the seat with the state seed control officials today, and one of the problems we're having in the industry is underfunding of seed regulatory laboratories. They're being closed, um, and, and I think part of the issue is is that people do not understand the value of seeds. And when when you compare seeds to all of agriculture, it's just a small small part. Of, of, uh, of the agricultural economy. And because of that, what, what drives the states to do things is money. And, and if, if the seed industry is only a small portion of agriculture, then sometimes they don't get the attention they really need. Seeds is not really taught that much. Okay, I need you to go back one. <laughs> All right, they're not, that, they're not taught very much in the schools in agronomy. My three degrees are in agronomy. I think for my bachelor's degree, we spent maybe two hours talking about seeds the entire four years. And, th and basically, it, they just said, well, plant, plant good seeds. It wasn't very much. My, my master's degree, no talk about seeds. Finally, when I got to Mississippi State, uh, I spent six years learning about seeds. And every course I had had to do with seed. So this, this is an industry that's very diverse and very complex. And it has all of the moving pieces of, every, of any other industry that has a living, um, that deals with living materials. 
and, um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that because because I'm not really a, a, a business kind of leader, but uh, but just suffice it to say that I can't even understand it all. It, it's just too complex for me, and it's changing at an incredible rate. Okay, I am finally figuring this thing out. <laughs> okay, so to me they're very important, and they're the source of life as we know it. And, and every solution that these big R&D companies come up with uh, that has anything to do with biotechnology in our food and plants, the solutions are, are delivered in seeds. They have to be. That's the only way it can happen. That when biotechnology changes the, the genetic makeup, the only way to take advantage of that is in the next generation, in seeds. <laughs> seeds are the source of all, living, of all things agricultural. Um, if, you're, if you run a ranch, I'm sorry, you have to have seeds because you have to have the grass to, to provide the, the feed for your animals. Seeds, seeds is in every part of agriculture. It's the linchpin of every bit of society today. And if we want to change the world, we must first feed the people. And you start doing that with seeds. And so, there's actually nothing more important than seeds to me. And, and very few things that are of equal importance. So what is seed? Well, seeds are alive. That was the thing, when I was studying, <laughs> Well, you know, you just don't even think about it, seeds being alive that much. But, but uh, when, I, when I first arrived at Mississippi State, my major professor happened to be in China for six weeks. And so um, they didn't really know what to do with me. So they brought me this stack of books, which was a collection of all the papers they had written at Mississippi State about seeds. And they said, study this and, and you know, see if you can have that uh, studied by the time your professor gets back. And, and then we'll give you, uh, then he'll tell you what you're going to do. So I said, okay, and I, you know, that's, it looks like a lot of paper to me. <laughs> and so I started reading. And uh, in the second or third article, which was entitled Seed Power, uh, in the first paragraph, it, it said seeds are alive. And something happened inside of me that changed me. And because it, I had, it was a concept that I had not really spent any time thinking about, but that they are alive. Um, they have the same requirements for life as animals. Did you know that? It, it, it's, they're not like plants that you have to have a, a carbon dioxide rich environment and, and all that. But instead, seeds need oxygen. They are alive. And, and, and I just hadn't even thought about that. Well, they endure. And th they can live in conditions that are just uh, just kind of incredible. Uh, we, we try to store them in very, very dry conditions. And we store them in conditions, uh, uh, our longest term storage, it would be in, in the uh, air suspended above liquid nitrogen. So really cold. And, and they survive in those kinds of conditions. Seeds are incredible. They're also fragile. All right? And, and, and so they can be damaged easily. They're kind of like people, right? Uh, we, we can survive many, many things, but, but we're also fragile, all right? So to me, this was, it, it was like a revelation, all right? Well, so the essence of the seed industry is, this, is the ability to identify varieties or hybrids of seed that yield and have traits or characteristics that's what I mean by traits, that are uh, desired by the farmer or by the food processor. And then the, the industry delivers those to those people at a price or for a profit. Okay. Um, they're like every business. They, they're in business to make money. Um, but the commodity that they deal with is, is this commodity that I think is special. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of seeds and how this kind of came about, because uh, it, because it's important. All right. So uh, back back before our time, 
<laughs> back when we lived in an agrarian society, almost everybody was a farmer or, or uh, a producer of some sort. And so uh, the desire of the producer was to produce food, feed, and fiber, all right? And the idea then is that you would provide for your family by the sweat of your brow working in the farm, all right? So as farmers were working, what they would notice is uh, certain parts of the field might have, um, might produce more than other parts of the field, or, uh, or certain plants might produce better than other plants. And so farmers, are, they're pretty smart, and they decided to, to, uh, to keep certain seeds that came from, from uh, those plants and see if that, same, if that seed would continue to produce uh, more grain for the for their family, all right. Well, they came to understand heredity, and, and you know it's written in all the oldest literature, right? And it, it it is that whatever a man shall sow, that shall he also reap. So if if they planted this seed, if they planted corn, actually they would get back corn, all right? And that was an important thing to remember, all right. And if it if it yielded well, they they could expect good yields the next time. If, it, if you plant bean seeds, you get bean plants back. And, and that was an important concept to learn. Well, so they selected the plants. Farmers naturally selected plants that had the best value and the best characteristics. <clears throat> and that grain was kept separate. Okay. And then if that grain was still left over after the long, hard winter, they would use that to plant the next year. Okay. Well, as farmers learned more about this selection of seed, they also uh, came to realize that there were other forms of improvement that were needed. And so there were people like Jethro Tull that lived over in England. Uh, he invented the first seed drill, a me mechanical seed drill. And, and what happened is they be farmers began to, to mechanize and to, to, uh, to plant seeds in such a way that the farmer didn't have to spend all of his time actually working on the farm. And, uh, and so and it only happened incrementally, of course. Uh, all right. So uh, I know that when I worked on the farm, we worked, you know, sun up, sun, uh, sun down. Right? There weren't the the eight-hour farmers. They had, they didn't exist yet. <laughs> right? But uh, in this in those this day and age, though, that this is the beginning of the farmers that were able to actually do other things because they were able to mechanize some of these things, and. Um, so this mechanized farming and harvesting was improved by many, many individuals like Eli Whitney with the cotton gin and other milling machines and Patrick Bell and Hugh McKay and, and others. And they, interesting enough, they all lived around the same time, okay, in, in the early 1800s. And they developed these kinds of things. And so you hear of the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution, they, it, it hit farmers at the same time it hit the rest of industry. Okay. At the same time, or actually just a little earlier, uh, it's about the same time, Gregor Mendel, who was a, a, an Augustinian friar who lived in the Czech Republic, he, he started, he was interested in actually honeybees. <laughs> and he started uh, taking his bees and getting them to breed together, but you know they were all around the the monastery, and then I guess the other monks didn't like it, <laughs> and so uh, the the head of the monastery, the uh, abbot, came and and asked Gregor to give up his bees and to work on sweet peas, and so Gregor Mendel began to breed sweet peas, and he experimented, and he was able to describe heredity at that time. And the laws that he described at that time, in, in, in 1856 to 1863, are the very laws that we understand and live by today when we do crop improvement and, and plant breeding. And those, and that becomes known as the Mendelian genetics or heredity, or inheritance. <coughs> he published in 1866, but an interesting thing happened is that when he published, his papers and his work were all forgotten. And, and nobody really worked on this until in, in 1900, there were three scientists in different parts of Europe 
that discovered his writings at the same time and, and began to establish seed improvement uh, organizations. And that's the beginning of the seed industry that we know today. Well, so prior to 1900, in the U.S., seeds were, were more or less uh, provided for farmers. So you had the USDA with their plant introduction stations. They had uh, little places where they did research on the, on the local seeds, and they would provide seed for farmers in their area. Um, there are also the land-grant institutions, um, like Purdue, and uh, Iowa State, and Kansas State, and those state uh, universities that uh, performed research functions for, for each state. And they would provide seed to the farmers. But uh, somewhere around 1900, there began to be a movement where there were, in, in each state, the, uh, the farmers that produced seeds began to organize together. And they formed the Crop Improvement Associations and the, uh, the other organizations. And so what happens is, kind of around that time, each state had their own organization. And what I see today when I work with these guys is that each state has... Uh, 44 out of the 50 states have an organization today that does seed improvement and crop improvement. But in every state, they're organized differently. So in some states, they're part... In, in Indiana, it's part of the, the, uh, the university, okay? In, uh, in Kansas, it is a, an independent association. Uh, in Texas, it is a, a, an appointed... Uh, position at the, the State Department of Agriculture. So each each, unit, uh, each uh, state kind of runs this in their own way, but the function is the same, and that is to set quality standards for genetic purity. So the farmer selected the seed and selected that one that would provide the, the, the yield and the traits and characteristics that he liked. The purpose of this group is to maintain the, that identity and to provide larger quantities of seed for the, the, the wider environment, more and more farmers. By the 1930s, a man by the name of uh, Henry Wallace and his partners began to work by taking um, pollen from one plant and introducing it to uh, to the uh, flowers of another plant, and, and he created hybrid crops. And um, you might have heard of Pioneer <laughs> Hybrids International. <laughs> I know. Yeah. A shout out to our, our friends over here. <laughs> okay. And Henry Wallace and his partners formed these two companies, Pioneer <laughs> uh, International and also Garst Seed Company. And an interesting thing happened, and it's, and it's history repeats itself, as you know. The invention of hybrid crops was not well received by farmers, because it was a little unnatural, you know. And, and what happened was we were removing the male flowers from one plant and not letting them fertilize themselves like they were, would in nature. And we forced them to fertilize with the plants that we wanted to be the parent, and so it was just not well accepted. And, uh, and farmers didn't, didn't plant hybrid seed when it was first invented. Does that sound like GMOs to you guys? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> so it was not accepted at that time. But there was a, a huge event in, world, in the world that happened in the 40s. And what happened was uh, we had a lot of young men that went off to war. And they went and... Um, they traveled to a lot of different places, and they found out there are a lot of ways to do things. And when they came back, they had new ideas. And, and I believe that, uh, that those men, when they came back and, and came back to the farms and eventually took over the operations, they were open those, to those kinds of changes. And so uh, the beginning of the Green Revolution happened as, back, as far back as the 50s, when farmers began to plant hybrid seed, and, and to raise corn, all right? Well, so that in the 50s, they were accepted 
and began to be planted. And in fact, uh, the first hybrids were all quite tall. And uh, we had a little problem with plants that would, would be so tall, in fact, that they fell over. And, uh, and, and not just corn and hybrids, but also wheat. And what we found is that um, as we increased the yields of wheat, the wheat heads would get so big and so heavy that the, the, the plants would fall over. Now, when I was working in Idaho on the farm, I, I was involved in irrigation. And we'd carry sprinkler pipes, and, and I would have to carry the pipes this hall, uh, this hot, uh, over the top of the wheat. And what would happen is, through the year, as the wind would come up, eventually, I never saw a wheat field that actually was standing at harvest time when I was growing up. I, I just didn't know that happened. And, because we had irrigated wheat, and it was always laying on the ground. And so the farmer would have to, to drop his, uh, the, the harvester head clear to the ground, then harvest rocks and all, in order to get the wheat. But there was a man by the name of Norman Borlaug that, that worked at uh, Simit in Mexico, figured out how to shorten wheat stocks, and all of a sudden we're able to feed billions more people uh, internationally. Right? He worked a lot uh, helping, helping children eat, right? and is credited with feeding a billion people. So that's, that's pretty incredible. <coughs> Well, today there's a new generate, a new, uh, a new technology, and that's biotechnology. And, and so uh, today, those things uh, that are happening today seem a little unnatural too. All right, I, I'll admit that. Um, where we take a gene from one organism and we can put it into a, another organism, and you get the plants to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Or you get the plant to actually do things that it has the capability to do, but doesn't do it well enough. So we've, we've done some things like that. Well, the future seed industry is, yeah, it's, there's a lot of questions out there. All right? So we, we know that today we're predicting a, a population, a world population of 9 billion people by 2050. Uh, that's a lot of people to feed. Okay. Um, Agricultural land is being used for other purposes at, a, at an increasing rate. Uh, there's just less and less farmland every year. Um, they're going to build a new highway across the farm just next to my house. All right. But every acre decreases the ability of man to produce more grain. Okay. Unless he can take the existing acres and produce more per acre. So in the next 25 years, it is predicted that we will have to increase yields by 100% in order to feed 9 billion people. That's a pretty big challenge. And how are we going to do it? Well, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions, and you'll, you'll read a lot about it in the news. How are we going to get this done? Um, you can't do GMOs, all right? Well, I'm here to tell you that even though GMOs will not feed the world and they can't solve all the problems, at least they're a tool, all right? And so it's a tool that we have to use. Um, there, ha there are going to have to be new production practices that, that we are going to use to, to help uh, increase the yields on those acres. Uh, that means we're going to have to do something to plants to help them live through drought, maybe. It, is the, pup, is the uh, environment really getting warmer? If it is, can we, uh, can we make plants that will be more adaptable to warmer temperatures or other conditions? Plant breeding is going to have a huge, a huge role in this, and all of these things will have to be delivered in seeds. To me, it's exciting because it's a little bitty thing, but with that little bitty thing and the magic that it holds, we'll be able to feed these people. And that's my presentation for today. Oh, are there any questions? Oh. Yeah, I'm wondering with all of these different 
different species of genes that they're interjecting into the corn plant or whatever. Is that working out pretty well? I mean, I just heard a lot about it. I don't know what's really going on. Right, so th they've been working on it for a long time, right? Um, and when I was working at Mississippi State is when the very first one came out. And um, at that time, what I found was that uh, there are a lot of things that they've done and they just really don't know what to do with. And so when I was at Mississippi State, it was actually a seed company that came to the university and said, okay, so now we have this, we have this new cotton that if we plant this cotton, which the big problem with cotton is that you have to spray for insects up to 12 times in one season. Okay, so it's, and when you drive into the Mississippi Delta, I don't know if you know this, but you can smell the chemical in the air. All right. If we can reduce that chemical by planting this seed, would that be a good thing? So we we're all saying, yeah, that'd be pretty good. Well, what are we going to charge for it? Because it was $45 a bag at that time. And it, and they were saying, well, what if we charge $90 a bag? And of course, all of us at the university rolled our eyes. <laughs> well, today we charge way more than $95 a bag. So, because the farmer wants it and he buys it. And it's, it's, uh, it's protecting, it's protecting our, our uh, it's protecting people and animals alike that don't have to breathe in all that chemical. Instead, it contains the chemical in a very small area, and we don't have to breathe that stuff in. I, I think it's working really well. There are new things that we don't know what they can do yet, or how we can utilize them. Well, in the food crops, a lot of people, they're they concerned. Them, they reject them. Is there a reason for that? Well, so what? <laughs> that, that is the concern, right? Okay, so if we put this stuff in there, is it going to make people sick? Well, and so initially when, when we were doing the research, what we did was we, we tested it on animals to see if it was causing anything. And we couldn't find any, any uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't find that they, the grain acted any differently than the normal grain. And so when we talked with the FDA about that, they agreed. And, and so it was approved. So those first ones went out in, the, in about 95. Excuse me. And since 95, We've all been eating. And if they're going to kill people, they sh people should be dying all over the place right now. All right? All right, so that's not very scientific. But, but the truth is, if you observe, there has not been one person who has died because of this yet. Where, where you can actually say, okay, here's the cause, and it has killed something. Someday, somebody probably will die because of it. But it's, it hasn't happened. Just for your information, we've been eating GMO tomatoes for over 50 years. And nobody knows it. Yeah. That's right. I'm a row crop guy. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. You're right. And um, I, I don't know. It's... It, all right, if you think about DNA, it, it, we all have DNA, right? It's, and um, the DNA itself, I don't believe, is going to harm us, okay? And it's contained in all the meat we eat, all the plants we eat. That's not going to harm us, right? And uh, what happens is uh, it, the DNA that, gets, that your own body creates or that gets... In, situated in your own genome, which is all a metabolic thing, that's the stuff that actually does things to you. The DNA you eat gets digested. The, uh, you're talking doubling the output of, of crops. Yeah. When you, when you do that much quantity, I, I always wonder about quality. Well, all right, so uh, this is a good concern. And... Um, we have to do that better. That's all I can say right now. Uh, today, um, I, I'm trying to think of a good example. All right, I, I remember we used to hate, um, when I was younger, we would say, okay, this is made in Japan. We don't like that. <laughs> I, I mean, I've heard those words come out of my dad's mouth. I don't know how many times. 
Um, but now, the things that, there, there were quality issues at that time. And today, the quality coming out of Japan, like in their cars, actually is quite good. And so quality is something that, that is about behavior. All right? And so when we produce things at larger and larger amounts, quality means you make it consistently, the same way, and that it is the same or better. And, and that's, that's part of my role, is to teach how you behave in such a way that you have consistent results. So, uh, I mean, that's how we have to do it, I think. How much time do I have? Okay. Okay. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you.